Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Bruno Yoon, and I'm one of the Athenaeum Fellows this year. I'll start this introduction with a conversation I had last Friday. I overheard a student being frustrated with VMOC. Now, for those who don't know, VMOC is a resume reading program used and highly recommended by CMC's Career Services, and it gives your resume a score based on how good it is, essentially. It's often helpful, but it is notorious for docking points where it shouldn't, as it did to this student. I took a moment to empathize with her frustration, and she was struggling for words for a bit, but she eventually came up with, it's so AI. <laughs> That's an interesting use of AI as an adjective to describe an automated resume reader that does not always understand context. Its work needs to be checked by humans. Hardly Skynet material. <laughs> the same could be said of AI in a more general sense, and here to argue along these lines tonight is Gary Smith, Fletcher Jones Professor of Economics at Pomona College. He received his PhD in economics from Yale University. He was an assistant professor there for seven years, and he's won two teaching awards and written or co-authored more than 80 academic papers and 13 books. Most recently, The AI Delusion, which is for sale in the lobby as you walk out. And he has published statistical and financial research in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, Scientific American, and a host of other widely read and well-respected publications. By the way, now is the time to adjust your seat, if you haven't done so already. As a reminder of the rules, I ask that you treat the Athenaeum like the movie theater in two ways. One, audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited, as always. Two, please take this opportunity to silence and put away your cell phones, just like at the movie theater, using them greatly detracts from the experience. Now, unlike the movie theater, you get to ask questions at the end. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Gary Smith. <clears throat> Thank you. I, uh, as you may know, I went to Harvey Budd College a long, long time ago. And uh, I was on the debate team at CMC for four years. I also did water polo and swimming at CMC for four years. And so I have a lot of fond memories of this place. It's nice to be back. AI, you all know, is artificial intelligence. Is we get in the echo chamber here, or is that just me hearing the echo? We're okay on the sound? Okay. So AI is artificial intelligence, and the idea that is circulating is that uh, computers are as smart as humans, or even smarter than humans. And that's what the AI delusion is about, is that that is a delusion. Now, I'm not saying computers are stupid, okay? Although sometimes they do stupid things. I joined uh, LinkedIn for some stupid reason, and uh, I get these things, people want to connect with me all the time, and I say, okay, blah, 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 blah. And then one time I got invited to connect with myself. <laughs> <laughs> now that's computer stupidity, that's uh, the human's little bug in the software, and that's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about useless. Computers are very useful, I use them every day in my life. 80 research papers, 13 books, every single one of them I couldn't do without a computer. And I'm not talking about word processing. I'm talking about mathematical calculations, I'm talking about statistical calculations, talking about Monte Carlo simulations. Some of these things, literally, I could not do in my lifetime if I was doing it with pencil and paper. Okay, computers are extremely useful. What I'm talking about is the idea that computers are intelligent in any meaningful sense of the word, that computers have anything resembling human intelligence. Now, part of the problem, I think, is, big word here, anthropomorphization, which is the tendency of humans to attribute human-like qualities to animals, to trees, to gingerbread cookies, and to other things. And so we all know the childhood story of the three little pigs, and we think nothing of the fact that these pigs are walking around on two legs, they're wearing clothes, they're carrying bricks and lumber and straw, they build houses, they have different work ethics, they meet a wolf and they outwit they out, out the wolf and they win in the end, and we think it's fine, we think it makes perfect sense. Well, we shouldn't do this to computers because it makes them very angry. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we see movies with R2-D2, C-3PO, and it seems perfectly natural that they walk around and they talk like humans, they think like humans, they plan, they have emotions, they have feelings. 
and it seems perfectly normal to us. Then we go a little bit farther. Computers are so smart, maybe they're going to come to their senses and realize the one threat to their existence is us. And so they'll have to enslave us or exterminate us. Well, that's total bullshit, okay? <laughs> computers don't know what humans are. They don't know what computers are. They don't know what the real world is. They don't know what survival is. They don't know what they would do to plan to survive to get rid of humans. They know none of that, okay? The real danger is not that computers are smarter than us, but that we think computers are smarter than us. And so we trust them to make important decisions they shouldn't be making. Scrabble. Everyone knows the game of Scrabble, right? You got these little tiles. They got letters on them. They got numbers on them. You put the tiles together to spell words, which are in the dictionary. And you get points based on that. P different points for different letters. You get double word, triple word, stuff like that. The greatest Scrabble player of all time, Nigel Richards. The most amazing thing he did was memorizing 386,000 words in the French Scrabble Dictionary. Nine weeks later, he won the French Scrabble Championship, even though he did not understand a single word of French. He knew bonjour, and he knew the numbers for reporting the score, but beyond that, he did not understand a single word of French. They said he played French Scrabble just as well as he played English. He was quick, decisive, and triumphant. He played like a computer. And I would say a computer is like Nigel Richards. They can put letters together, and they can spell check whether they're in a dictionary, but they have absolutely no idea what the words mean. Example of this, there's a CS professor at Stanford called Terry Winograd, named Terry Winograd. And he's got these things called Winograd schemas. I can't cut that tree down with that ax. It is too thick. What does it refer to? The tree, right? Because we're humans, we know what a tree is. We know what an ax is. We know what cut down means. And so we know it must refer to the tree. What about this one? Well, now it refers to the ax. Computers can't tell the difference. Computers don't know what it refers to in these two different versions of the sentence, and that's called the Winograd Schema Challenge. When you have a sentence with a word like it, what does it refer to? They have a competition called the Winograd Schema Challenge, and there's a $25,000 prize for any algorithm to get 90% of these questions right. What does it refer to? In the last competition, the highest score was 58%, and the lowest was 34%, because computers don't know what words mean. Okay, Like Nigel Richards, they can put letters together, and they can check a dictionary to see if the letters are in the dictionary, but they don't know what the words mean. Now, Oren Etziani, who's a uh, professor of computer science at the University of Washington and head of the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, quipped, how can computers take over the world if they don't know what it refers to in a sentence? And that goes back to my point. They don't know what humans are. They don't know what computers are. They don't know what the world is. They don't know what survival is. Here's an example from Roger Shank. He's one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence. And in the early days, what they were trying to do was build computers that would think like humans think. And it's very, very difficult, and they couldn't make much progress there. And so computers took a little detour, which is let's do things that are useful, like spell check and search. So here's an ad, IBM claiming that Watson can understand, reason, and learn. Okay. Shank, it would have made me laugh if it had not made me so angry. Watson is a fraud. I'm not saying that it can't crunch words, and there may be, well be value in that, but the ads are fraudulent. Bob Dylan, Nobel laureate, first one rock and roll singer. The enduring themes in his work is time passes and love fades. Now, if any of you are familiar with Bob Dylan, that's not what he was writing about. 
He was writing protest songs about civil rights and about the war in Vietnam. And so take passage like this. Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. Now we get the gist, right? We could argue about the details and stuff, but we get the point. A computer would have absolutely no idea what these words mean. Nowhere in Dylan's work is the word Vietnam mentioned or civil rights. But people knew that's what he was writing about. A computer would have no idea. A computer could spell check these words or count the number of times the words are used, but would have no idea what this passage means. Here's an example from Doug Hofstetter. When he was 35, he wrote this book, Goodell, Escher, and Bach. And he won a Pulitzer Prize, a National Book Award, and he was set up for life. He's been at the University of Indiana now for several years. He has appointments in six different departments, although he seldom visits any of them. He has his own little, <laughs> he doesn't teach any classes. He has his little house where he works with graduate students trying to build computers that mimic the human brain. Okay, and as I said, the industry passed him by. They went off to do things useful, and they stopped trying to mimic the human brain. So here's an example he comes up with. In their house, everything comes in pairs. There's his car and her car, his towels and her towels, his library and hers. What does that mean? Well, we read it and we know what it means. There's two people, apparently a male and a female. They share a house, but everything else is separate. Okay. Now, we give this to a state-of-the-art translation program like Google Translate, and what does it do? It looks at the sentences one by one and looks at the words one by one. It picks out the nouns and the adjectives, finds the equivalent in another language, and then puts it in some grammatically correct order. So what Hofstetter did was take this one, translate it to French, Google Translate, and then go back into English and see what you end up with. The first sentence is absolutely perfect, and Google Translate often comes up with perfect translations. It went to French and back with no change. The second sentence, there is his car and his car, his towels and towels, his library and his. Now, part of it's the masculine and feminine thing got all mixed, confused Google Translate completely, but the bigger point which Hofstetter makes is Google Translate does not make any attempt to understand what the person is saying. It has no idea what these passages mean, because that has no idea what these words mean. All it can do is take little parts of it, granular things, and put them in another language, okay? And sometimes the results are perfect, and sometimes they're ridiculous. The longer passages I invite you to look at on German and Chinese, which are, I mean, they're long, so I, I'm not doing them here, but they're absolutely preposterous what uh, Google Translate came up with. There's a nice analogy here. You got Roger Shank and Hofstadter and the other pioneers of AI. And they're down here on the ground and they're trying to figure out how to get up in the air, maybe all the way to the moon. And it's really, really hard. Really, really hard. So what people did is give up on that. Instead, they said, let's climb a tree. Let's spell check and do search of the internet and stuff like that that's useful and makes money. And so they climbed the tree. And it is useful. Maybe there's some fruit up here. Maybe you're safe from wild animals up there. But what happens when you get to the top of the tree? How are you going to get to the moon from there? And you're not. And so the argument is, Shank and Hofstad and others, is what you've got to do is start over again and try and do what they were trying to do originally, which is mimic the way the human brain works. Be able to think, to understand the world, understand what words mean, have common sense and wisdom, have critical thinking. Here's a little thing I drew. What is that? We know immediately, right? Because we see the skeletal essence. We see this rectangle, we see these circles, we see that line, we see this text, and we know immediately how they fit together. These could be pies or bowling balls or frisbees, but they're probably wheels, right? Because they're sitting below the little rectangle. So it's probably a wagon. There's probably two wheels on the other side, even though we can't see them. There's probably a cavity in the middle. 
we wouldn't be surprised at all if we looked inside and saw some kittens or toys or rocks. If a grown-up and a child came along, we wouldn't be surprised if the child got in the wagon and the grown-up pulled it. If the grown-up got in the wagon and the child pulled, we'd laugh, okay? Because we know what a wagon is. If the, we know this looks pretty primitive, pretty homemade, right? But it's in pretty good condition, so it's been well taken care of, or it's brand new. If there was a person standing there, we might think that he or she owned the wagon. We might think we could buy it for 50 bucks or 100 bucks or something like that. If the wagon was on a hill, we might think that if we got in, it would roll downhill. That'd be dangerous. We have all these thoughts because we know the world. We understand the world. We know this is a wagon, and we have thoughts associated with wagons. What about a computer? What computers do is they look at individual pixels. And they've been trained on lots of different pictures where they take the pixels and they map them in various ways. And then when they see something new, they take these pixels and they map them and they try and find something that matches pretty well. So I used a, a deep neural network at Cornell to try and guess what this is. This guess was it was 98% sure it was a business. <laughs> and I think the rectangle with the script kind of confused it. And it kind of ignored the, the two pies and, and the handle. I also gave it to uh, Wolfram's deep neural network. It said it was a badminton racket. <laughs> now, humans know better. We're not going to play badminton with that thing because we, we know what it is. And we weren't trained on a million pictures of wagons, right? We saw the skeletal essence. We saw the rectangle and the circles and the handle, and we know what it is. This is the basis for those CAPTCHAs. You take letters, and computers train on letters. If they see letters that like what they've been trained on, they know what it is. You take them and put them in a different font, or you twist them around a little bit, or make them different sizes, and they no longer can figure out what it is. Or you got these ones now with the little three by four boxes, and you click on the box that has a car in it. And if the car is partially obscured by a tree or a building or something like that, computers don't recognize it because it wasn't anything they trained on. Okay, and I'm not saying that image recognition software won't ever be better. It's always getting better. But the point is it makes no effort, no effort whatsoever to understand what it sees. It's just mapping pixels, the same way Nigel Richard mapped letters. This is Carnegie Mellon University. The paper was written, this is one of the authors, Mahmoud Sharif, and they trained a computer on him without the glasses and him, a celebrity. And they showed the picture, and they put the word Carson Daly, the words, and that picture and the words Mamou Sharif. And the computer program did its pixel matching, and it was 100% sure, every time you showed it one, it was 100% sure, 100% correct in what it identified as. Then you put on these little funny glasses, and you start mixing around with the colors up there. And all of a sudden, the computer is 100% sure that that's Carson Daly. Because computers don't know what faces are, they don't know what glasses are. We look at this, we see the glasses, and we look beyond the glasses. We look at the face. We look at the skeletal essence. We look at the nose, the mouth, the ears, the hair, and we know that those are not the same person. Here's another author. Exact same experiment. Perfect recognition when the pictures are the same ones they've been trained on. Then you throw in some glasses, and all of a sudden, it thinks this is Mila Jehovah. Okay. Because again, computers don't understand what they're doing. They're just mapping pixels, making something out of nothing. We're driving down the road. We come to an intersection. We look over there, see if there's a stop sign or a traffic light. We see the familiar shape, the familiar colors, the familiar letters, and we know it's a stop sign. And we know there are consequences if we don't stop. Okay. We might get hit by cars going the other direction. Computers trained on stop signs recognize them pretty well, except you disturb the picture a little bit. Put a little peace sign down here, and all of a sudden it doesn't know it's a stop sign anymore because it hasn't been trained to see, pixel, to see peace signs on stop signs. There was a recent paper where they took things like the stop sign. They changed one little pixel. Forget about the peace sign changed one little pixel, something we wouldn't even notice, and the computer no longer knew it was a stop sign, 74% of the time. 
change five pixels, and you can fool it 87% of the time. Now, one of these articles was co-authored by a guy at Google, and they were called adversarial attacks, with the obvious implication that people who want to do bad things can go around putting peace signs on stop signs, and self-driving cars could be chaotic. Also make something out of nothing. What's that? Black and yellow lines, right? Carnegie Mellon Deep Neural Network said it was a school bus. It saw the black and yellow, and somehow in its pixel recognition, it came up with school bus. Now, we know what a school bus is. Computers don't. We know school buses have wheels, they have windows, they have doors, they're shaped like that. We know that's not a school bus. This one's even crazier. What's that? Nothing, right? Modern art, maybe. <laughs> State-of-the-art deep neural network. That's a cheetah. <laughs> because computers don't know what a cheetah is. They've just been trained on pixels and words and try and match the two. We know it's not a cheetah because cheetahs have four legs. They got a big tail. They got a neck. They got a head. They got ears. They got eyes. They got a mouth. We know that's not a cheetah. Computers don't know it because they don't know anything about the world. Data mining and knowledge discovery. So Wired's a great magazine, okay? This is not great journalism. But it's very commonplace these days, and that's part of the motivation for this book. Correlation supersedes causation. Science can advance without coherent models, unified theories, or any mechanistic explanation at all. All you need to do is get a bunch of data and find some patterns. Who needs theory? The Economist, another great journal. Tone down the theorizing. Puritans creating models before testing them. The new breed ignores the whiteboard, chucking the numbers together, letting computers spot the patterns. Okay, and I'm going to argue that's dangerous for two reasons. One of which is computers don't know what they found because they don't know anything about the, uh, the real world. And the other thing is you can always find patterns even in random data. Okay, so I put together a model to predict stock prices. I teach finance, and so make some money, get some kind of AI model here. And so this mutual fund prospectus said uh, computer algorithms, well, that sounds good. Complex, well, that sounds good. Computerized system, that sounds good. <laughs> Eliminating any subjectivity of the, of the manager. Just turn it over the computer and let it pick stocks, okay? Well, I said, okay, I'll try that. So I found 50 possible variables for predicting the S&P 500. I estimated models with one to five variables. There's more than two million of them, but again, with computers, I can do that real quickly, right? And I came up with this model, which stock prices depend on C, M, A, L, and R. And it's pretty good. It's like a 60% uh, correlation between actual and predicted. Kind of missed that here. It was pretty good. What were those mystery variables? Well, that's what data mining comes up with. You ransack a whole bunch of data, you're going to find correlations that make no sense whatsoever. And a computer won't know. A computer doesn't know what a stock is, doesn't know what a stock price is, doesn't know what a temperature is. It, it knows how to spell the word, but it doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know what these places are. It has no idea what determines stock prices. It has no idea whether this relationship makes sense or not. Okay, I'm going to do some serious stuff now get some real models that fit well. This time I'm going with 100 variables. Okay. 0.88 correlation. This is one to five variables out of 100. AI. Really, really, really good. Okay. Another thing you use AI for is to uh, identify what uh, causes heart attacks. And so I got some data on 1,000 heart attack victims. I got 100 household expenditure categories. And then who needs theory? Let the AI algorithm loose and find the patterns. And it found that these heart attack victims spent more on fish, men's footwear, and less on pork, cheese, and cleaning products. Okay? And you can think to yourself, okay, after the fact, I'll make up a theory, knowledge discovery. Fish, maybe that's healthy. Footwear, maybe these people run around a lot. Pork and cheese must be bad for you. Cleaning products, too. Okay, pretty good. 
Facebook to predict burglaries. Here's a town where they, looked, they identified the 100 most popular nouns, 50 most popular adjectives, 50 most popular adverbs. Then looked on Facebook for 10 weeks, how often these words showed up compared to the number of burglaries committed the next day. And so which words are most useful for predicting burglaries? The two most helpful words were day and most. Okay? And maybe you laugh or maybe you can think of a reason. You know, who needs theory? You don't need a theory, but maybe you can think one up. Okay. Uh, 0.96 correlation. Pretty good model, huh? I could probably sell it. Was this knowledge discovery or noise discovery? Once we got past the temperatures, all three of those models were completely random data. Okay. Those that fish, that day, that most, that footwear, it's just random data. Because you can always find patterns in random data. And AI is really good at that. Computers are really good at finding patterns among ra random data. And that's what they did here. Well, is that enough? How good do these models do with new data? Well, here's my stock market model. And correlation, that's a negative sign up there. It was negatively related to stock prices. Here's the one on the burglaries. The correlation is essentially zero. Okay. Well, maybe the fact that you can estimate a model with training data and then test it with validation data, maybe you can get around that problem, right? Ransack the data, find a model, then test it with fresh data. If it doesn't work, throw it out and try again. So say you got 200 observations. Take 100 of them, estimate a model, find some variables that work, test it, ah, it doesn't work. Do it again. Works, doesn't work. Works, doesn't work. Works, works. Okay, it's just data mining again at a larger scale. Instead of data mining 100 observations, you data mine 200 observations. And again, you will find random things that work. On my two-word model, I estimated all possible two-word combinations for predicting burglaries. I had in sample, the 70 observations, the 10 weeks, and out of sample. And up here are a lot of two-word combinations that work well in sample and out of sample. Now remember, these are totally fake data. These aren't real words. These aren't real word numbers. They aren't real burglary data. But you can find something that fits in sample and out of sample. For example, thing and kid. 0.92 correlation in sample, 0.93 correlation out of sample. AI would say, we've done it. But of course, all they've done is proven that you can find patterns in random data. And that's the thing about data mining. We think that patterns are unusual and therefore meaningful. In fact, patterns are inevitable and therefore meaningless. And the bigger the data, the more likely it is that we'll find meaningless patterns. Okay. The more data you have to ransack, the more likely it is you find coincidental transitory correlations. It gets even worse when you do something like a deep neural network, which puts it inside a black box where nobody knows what the computer algorithm is doing. It comes up and says, like that mutual fund prospectus, you ought to buy this stock. Why? Well, I don't know. It's inside the black box. You ought to arrest this person. Why? I don't know. It's inside the black box. You ought to deny this job application. Why? I don't know. It's inside the black box. And what they're doing is finding coincidental temporary correlations, which may or may not make sense, and we have no way of judging. And the computer has no way of judging because the computer doesn't know what anything means. It doesn't know what words mean. It doesn't know anything about the real world. All it can do is find patterns. So here's some examples. Google flu. I'll check my time here. Good. Inside a black box, they didn't want anyone to know what the words were for sake of privacy or something. And they found these Google search terms that predicted flus with 97.5% accuracy. That's in sample. Like the stock market thing, it was 88% accurate. Or the burglaries were 95% accurate. 
Now let's go outside sample. They overestimated by 100 in the next 108 weeks, an average of nearly 100% off. So they abandoned Google flu, okay, which is good. Next one, software for evaluating job applicants. Searched a bunch of stuff, and they found that good programmers visited a particular Japanese manga site. The chief scientist says, obviously, it's not a causal relationship. Well, why in the heck are they using it? They found a temporary correlation, and they went with it. The company's algorithm looks at dozens of variables, constantly changes the variables as correlations come and go. Why are they constantly changing the variables? Because they're finding temporary coincidental correlations that vanish with fresh data. So they've got to do it over again. They find temporary coincidental correlations that vanish, and they've got to do it over again. If they had variables that were actually good predictors of whether someone was a programmer, they wouldn't have to change them every few weeks. How well does it work in practice? Customers really, really hate the product. <laughs> There's almost no customers have had a positive experience. Okay. I would also point out this is discriminatory, right? Only certain people visit this Japanese manga site, and other people undoubtedly don't. Data mining analysis of phone usage said people are good uh, credit risk if they use an Android phone. They don't answer incoming calls. Have outgoing calls that are not answered. Do not keep their phones fully charged. Now, you might think I'm making this up, but I'm not. I mean, this is a real program, a real algorithm for deciding whether I should loan you money, okay, based on these silly things, some data mined AI program. Now, you could probably make up theories for this after the fact, why it makes sense. Except it's actually, these are people who are bad credit risk, so it's the other way around. So you could probably make up theories for that, too. The major point is, it's just coincidental correlation. So why do we believe them? Because we think computers are smarter than us. They're going to base car insurance rates not on your driving record or anything else, but on the words you use on Facebook. I, again, I'm not making this up, OK? <laughs> they started off with things that they thought sort of made sense, like, do you make lists? Well, maybe that's got something to do with something. Do you set specific times to meet instead of saying tonight? Maybe that's something. Do you use words like always, never, maybe, perhaps? I don't know which are good and which are bad, but they thought it might make a difference. And then do you like Michael Jordan or Leonard Cohen? <laughs> well, now we're getting a little far away from what's going on here. And then they wandered totally off into data mining uh, hell. Our analysis is based on thousands of different combinations of likes, words, and phrases. It's constantly changing. Well, there's the giveaway right there. Why is it constantly changing? Because it doesn't work, right? They find a temporary correlation, doesn't work. Find another temporary correlation, doesn't work. Our calculations reflect how humans behave as opposed to fixed assumptions about what makes a safe driver. Fixed assumptions like how many accidents you have or things like that, how many tickets you get. Instead, we'll go with Facebook words. Why do people believe this stuff? Because they think computers are smarter than them. Now, in this particular case, uh, the day before they were going to launch, Facebook stopped them with a lawsuit and said, uh, there's some provision of some Facebook contract that says you cannot use Facebook words to price insurance, either to, either to approve applications or to set insurance rates. Now, Facebook was not being altruistic. They have their own patented algorithm for doing that. Okay. <laughs> so we should expect that pretty soon. Algorithmic criminology. It's spreading the country. Somebody gets arrested. How much bail should be set? Turn to an AI program. Somebody gets convicted. How long should they go to jail? Turn to an AI program. Somebody applies for bail. I'm sorry, somebody applies for parole. Turn to an AI program. Here's what this guy says. The approach is black box, for which no apologies are made. If I could use sunspots, shoe size, or the size of the wristband, I would. If I give the algorithm enough predictors to get it started, it finds things you wouldn't anticipate. What are things you wouldn't anticipate? 
things that make no sense, like wristband sizes, right? Why do people believe this nonsense? Because they think computers are smarter than them. No, it doesn't work very well, but it's still being used all over the country. Eighty-nine point five percent accuracy. I can tell whether you're a criminal by looking at your face. Laid an AI program loose on your face. Is all Chinese males. There's three criminals. This is from their article. And there's three non-criminals. Now you and I might notice a few differences. These guys all seem to have suits on. These guys all seem to be smiling. So maybe this AI algorithm is some kind of smile detector or something like that. There's a movie Minority Report about these psychics, precogs, could visualize murders before they happen. And so the uh, pre-crime police would go out and arrest somebody before they committed a murder. Well, that's got the usual crime, you know, time travel problems, you know. If you arrest them before they commit the murder, how do you see the murder, which never happens? And so that's kind of a problem. But this doesn't have this. These people may have committed crimes that they were never arrested for. But now we've got them because we've got our facial recognition software. And so we can arrest them. A blogger wrote, what if they just placed the people that look like criminals into an internment camp? What harm would that do? They would just have to stay there and go through an intensive rehabilitation program. Even if some of them were innocent, how could that adversely affect them in the long run? Why do we believe this nonsense? Because we think computers are smarter than us. We think important decisions should be turned over to computers. Even more scary. Letting robots fight out wars. Give them some kind of vague instructions and let them fight it out and see what happens. Okay, enough said on that one. <laughs> now, one of the big topics talking to students here tonight is, are you all going to get jobs or are computers going to take your jobs? Well, the thing you're learning or you know already from college is critical thinking, okay? Computers do not have any critical thinking skills. They have no common sense. They have no wisdom. They don't understand the world in any real sense. They're not going to take away any kind of job that requires critical thinking skills. So here's a list from this guy of critical thinker. <coughs> Judges well the credibility of sources. Can computers do that? No. Identify reasons, assumptions, conclusions. Can computers do that? No. Ask appropriate clarifying questions? Nope. Judges the quality of an argument? <laughs> they don't understand the argument. How can they judge the quality? Develop and defend a reasonable position. Computers can't come up with theories because they don't understand the world they live in, that we live in. Formulate plausible hypotheses? I don't think so. Draw conclusions? I don't think so. Because again, they don't understand the world that we live in. Okay. That's why the punchline again is, the real danger today is not that computers are smarter than us and they're going to eliminate us or enslave us. The real danger today is that we think computers are smarter than us and we're going to let them make important decisions that they shouldn't be making. So. Questions? <coughs> Hello? Yeah. All right, we now have time for questions. Please raise your hand and one of us will bring a mic to you. Please say your name and stand up. <coughs> um, hi, my name is Yao. I'm from CMC. I'm a junior. And um, I have a question for you. You said it's not a problem that uh, it's, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not that the problem is not that we leave, we think, uh, oh. It's not like AI is smarter than us, it's that we think they are smarter than us and like make them, uh, let them make important decisions. So what kind of decisions do you think is like not important? Because like, I mean. Well, things like spell checking 
internet searches, tightening bolts, those kinds of things, very narrowly defined tasks, computers are really good at, okay? But any kind of general thinking, or taking some kind of thinking here and applying to some other thing, or making anything that involves critical thinking, computers absolutely cannot do because they don't understand what words mean. Okay. What about like human scheduling, like um, assist, kind of personal assistance, and um, you mean like shopping for you, or yeah, <laughs> maybe like s making schedules for you. <laughs> well, they, w they wouldn't know what the words mean, so you'd have to write out very, very carefully. You know, it's like. <laughs> When one spouse goes shopping, the other one's got to send a very detailed list or you come back with the wrong size, the wrong brand, or the wrong something. So you'd have to be very detailed because you can't just say, go buy some orange juice because they don't know what orange juice means. You'd have to write it out and you have to say what size and what, uh, what company and stuff like that. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. My name's Jafar, I'm from CMC. Um, I'm just curious as to like, what do you think like the relationship between AI and like systems of power are? Because it seems like, just think like, right now AI is currently like plugged into these dopamine systems run by like companies like Facebook and, and just like social media systems, right? They, yeah. they the, and targeted advertising. Yeah. Can you speak on that? Because I feel like that's like the biggest what, thing. What, is, what does Zuckerberg say about people who turn their personal information over to Facebook? A bunch of dumb Fs? Is that, is that what he said? <laughs> but that's like not realistic now because everybody... Well, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> I guess... The, I, mean, what, what, I mean, I don't know. We're different generations. I don't understand why people go on Facebook to share what they're having for lunch or dinner and why people read about that and care about that. It seems very. It seems very egotistical to think that other people care about what you're eating or what you're reading or what you're doing. It, it's kind of. What I keeps use you bad up words. I use bad like words here, but. <laughs> what's like? What's the scariest thing about like the way people use AI now? What like? Well, one of the what, well, first for all these kinds of decisions. I mean, send somebody to jail for seven years because the AI algorithm says they ought to go for seven years, and it's inside a black box. So you have absolutely no idea what why the computer program said that. You don't know if they put in false information. You don't know if they're looking at the wristband size. You have no way to challenge that, and yet it's happening today. Or you're getting turned down for a job, you're getting turned down for a loan because of a word you used on Facebook. Uh, it, it, it's, it's preposterous. But the most dangerous thing, which I talked about with somebody before, maybe, is the government surveillance. I mean, this whole idea of identifying criminals by looking at their faces and stuff like that. And these countries, the U.S. is not quite there yet, but these countries where cameras are everywhere and surveying everything you do, and you have no privacy whatsoever, I, I, think, I think that's terrifying. Thank you. What's that province in China where the, they have the Muslims? And yeah, there's like, how many, how many millions of them are in prison right now? You know, <laughs> but there's, there's, there's lots of there's lots of them. And so I go over and start talking to you, and the camera sees it, and they think we're subversive, and it's next thing you know we're both in jail. I mean, that, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, that, that is a real scary thing, even scarier than you not getting a job, okay? <laughs> the government thinks we're conspiring because we, we look like we're talking to each other, and they don't like the, our, our faces or our clothes or whatever, or they're monitoring our email or monitoring our phones. And better safe than sorry. If in doubt, throw them in jail. <laughs> I thought I just said them, but... <laughs> oh. yeah. Well, the fact that we turn these important decisions, like fighting wars... But I mean, like, historically, like, since... since um, well, I'd say the most, the most dangerous one right now is the whole quiz algorithmic criminology. The fact that deciding how long you should stay in jail based on some algorithm that you have no idea what inputs went in there, and you have no idea what they're looking at. If they're looking at your wristband size, or if you're looking at your past record or what's going on. That, that is, I mean, that you're taking away your life and liberty, okay? And the fact that these people are willing to say, well, if computer thinks you're a criminal by looking at your face, what harm is there if we put you in jail? <laughs> I mean, if that becomes widespread, God forbid. So what would you suggest that lawmakers should do? 
Well, I think part of, part of his, uh, well, one of the points of this book is, of course, is, is education, trying to educate the public so they're not so overawed by AI. That just because a computer program says this doesn't mean it's true. I mean, that's part of the thing. And the other thing which is happening in the industry is people are going trying to go back to the roots, the Roger Shanks, the Doug Hofstadters, trying to build computer AI programs that actually think the way humans think, that actually understand the world, know what words mean, know what consequences are, have cause and effect, things like that. And it's really, really hard, but people are trying. Like I, Oren Etziani up at uh, the Allen that I mentioned before about how can computers take over the world where they don't know what it refers to. He's trying to build computer programs that have common sense. And that is really, really hard to have common sense. And so you have these questions like, is it okay to drink sulfuric acid if I put orange juice in it? We know the answer. A computer doesn't know the answer. A computer doesn't know what the two things are. It doesn't know what putting them together are. Is it okay to jump off a building 30 feet high? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Computers don't know. Another, another tact is people are studying how do babies learn? How do baby brains learn? And seeing if they can somehow modify that to get computers to learn the way babies learn. Not by, when, when babies see a picture, they don't have to see a million wagons to know it's a wagon, right? And so instead of doing pixel mappings, somehow figure out what, the, what Hofstetter calls the skeletal essence of something. Recognize the skeletal essence, the rectangle, the circles, the handle, and put them together and know it's a wagon, the way babies learn that that's a wagon. And that's hard too, it's really, really hard. That's why the profession went off and did something profitable. Manfred. Um, <laughs> my name is Manfred Kyle. Um, <coughs> Gary and I used an AI program last summer to predict that West Germany would win the World Cup, so that was pretty <laughs> bad. Um, from the book... Hey, I got uh, second place in that contest. Yeah. From, from the book, um, I, I was hoping you would also say something about the Hillary Clinton campaign yep. and how they used it, because I thought that was, that was pretty telling. Yep. So the introductory chapter is about uh, politics, where AI is being used. And so the campaign before the last one, when Hillary Clinton ran, she was the overwhelming favorite. She had the name, she had the power, she had the establishment, she had the money. And then along came this guy with an unhelpful name, Barack Obama. And he, he won. And part of his secret was he had this huge database of pretty much every voter in the country. And they'd isolated what kind of things appeal to you and to you and to you and they had micro-targeted appeals. And I mean, part of it was obviously his charisma and his eloquence, but he also had this huge database. And he went out and he won. Next time around, when Hillary ran, she said, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna be a Barack Obama. I'm gonna have a big database, and I'm gonna do micro-targeting. In fact, hired people from the Obama campaign to work on her campaign. And they built this secret computer program called ADA, after a, a female mathematician from many centuries ago. And hardly anyone knew it existed, okay? It was a big secret because they didn't want to make, make her seem scripted and stuff like that. And so she had this AI program and it was telling the campaign how to spend virtually every dollar they spent on television money, where to go for campaign appearances, and what issues to push. And Ada failed because Ada missed things that you can't quantify. When Bernie Sanders gave a speech, tens of thousands of people showed up. When Trump gave a speech, tens of thousands of people showed up. When Hillary Clinton gave a speech, 100 people showed up and sat there quietly. And you can't put that in a computer, okay? And so a computer was just going by things it could measure. And it said, here's these Rust Belt states, the, the reliable Democratic states in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, they're gonna go Democratic, forget about those. Let's go campaign in Arizona so we can have a landslide. Stupidity, right, absolute stupidity because they couldn't measure enthusiasm. And it wasn't until very late in the campaign they realized that there might be a little bit of a problem there. Then they decided to go out and campaign for rural voters. Again, late in the campaign. They signed one person. It was somebody from Brooklyn, <laughs> which didn't make a big impact out, out in the Midwest. And this campaign, it was missing the idea that emotions matter. It, was, it, didn't, even bother to, it didn't even bother to collect polls in Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota. People on the ground were begging, we've gotta go in and do something or we're gonna lose these states. But Ada said, no, those are democratic states, you're gonna win them. The computer said, here's what you ought to say. 
Hillary Clinton. I'm not perfect, but Trump's worse. Okay. Bill Clinton, the greatest campaigner any of us have ever seen, when he won the election, when he ran for president and won, what was his campaign? It's the economy, stupid. What people care about is their jobs. And that's what Hillary Clinton should have been doing. And if she'd listened to Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, she would have known issues that resonated with voters. But Ada didn't know any of that. And so they ended up losing. And so she was failed by, by big data and AI. Yeah, we've, we've talked a lot before. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, you spoke a lot of the um, downsides of AI, um, but what do you think are the benefits, uh, specifically in financial markets? Uh, you know, there's Rumstomp technology, very successful yep. hedge fund, yep. um, that, you know, they would use AI to comb through a, a 10Q upon it being released and stuff. Yep. Yep. great on it. Um, so yep. if, if AI can't understand words, how can it seemingly understand what yep. you know, management guidance and so is given? And so Computers are really good at crunching numbers. And the issue, the main issue I have is do you follow the scientific method, which is start with a theory and test it with the data, or do you start with the data and discover a theory which might be a coincidence? And the thing about Renaissance technology is they start with theory. We don't know exactly what they do. Because you gotta sign a non-disclosure agreement that not only says I'm not gonna tell you what we do inside our company, I'm not even gonna tell you I work for the company. Okay? But some stuff is leaked out. I got a former student who's was, ran a fund of funds and heavily involved in the industry. And some of the stuff they do, it makes total sense. They got a bunch of mathematicians, but they're looking at things that make sense. Like here's a market that's closed for some holiday in one country and open in another country. And so a little wedge might open up in between the prices being equal or not equal. Or here's a thinly traded stock and there's only one person buying and there's a whole lot of people selling. If I can predict when you come in to buy, then I can take the other side of the market and take money from you. And so they're not doing random stuff like weathers in Curtin the weather in Curtin, Australia or something like that. They're looking at things that make sense and then they use the, the data to test the models. And that, that's, that's great, I love that. I mean, that is the scientific method. Theory first, data later, okay. And where AI goes astray is when it does data mining, which is look at the data, find a pattern, enough's enough. What did you say before? Up is up, or you said something, you didn't say up is up. One of my colleagues has up is up. But the numbers, let the numbers speak for themselves. The numbers speak for themselves. Who needs theory? Okay. Now I said up is up, I have a colleague, I think he's here somewhere, Jay Cordes. I'm writing the next book, it's called uh, 10 Commandments of Data Science. And he worked in the industry for 15 years doing all sorts of stuff. He's got all sorts, all sorts of great stories. One of them is, you all know The Office, right? He lived The Office, okay. <laughs> he lived The Office. The crazy stuff going out of there. But one of his managers, one of his favorite phrases was, up is up. You got something going along in revenue, you happen to do something, the revenue jumps. Jay says, I don't know why it jumped. And the manager says, I don't care, up is up. Whatever you did, do it again. Then the revenue goes down. What happened? Well, it was a coincidence, it was a blip. And that, that's the problem with data mining where you just look for patterns and assume they're meaningful when in fact there's so much noise in the data, a lot of what you see is just coincidental, transitory blips. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Please wait until one of us brings the mic to you. Hi, Andy, Ann. Okay, hi, my name is Andy. And hi. Thank you for speaking today. Um, I was just wondering, what the implications about this are for self-driving cars. Do you think that driving is too, or requires too much critical thinking for computers to be able to handle it right it's now? It's an open question. I mean, right now, the self-driving cars, you're supposed to have a driver there with the hands on the wheel watching the road, okay? And if you don't, then that's not, you're violating the, the rules of the game, okay? Well, that's not a self-driving car, right? That's you with your hands on the wheel. And there are a lot of things that right now the algorithms can't handle. Like one of them apparently is, if there's something stopped in front of you, you crash into it. Because it's been programmed to deal with things that are moving when they slow down and speed up. And when something's stopped, it doesn't know what to do about that. The other thing is those adversarial attacks. Okay. So say you have self-driving trucks crisscrossing the country. And you got a bunch of angry truck drivers. And they start gimmicking with stop signs and stuff like that to cause crashes. 
what do you do about that? And so right now it's an open question whether they're going to surmount all those things, but I, I wouldn't sit in the back seat of a car that's self-driving. <laughs> on, on the other hand, as Jay says, <laughs> you look at a lot of people on the road and they drive even worse than that, right? <laughs> they're drunk, they're stupid, they're texting, and they're worse than a self-driving car that doesn't know what to do. Hi, my name is AJ Moore. I'm a freshman at CMC. I know that you said artificial intelligence isn't capable of critical thinking and stuff, so I'm wondering what your personal opinion is when it comes to artificial intelligence being able to create art, any kinds of art, because I think of the formulaicness of certain like pop hits, like lyric-wise, yeah. and I don't know if you can even call that art, yeah. but <laughs> whether it be dance or lyrics or poetry or painting or any of that, I'm just wondering if you think it's possible <coughs> or yeah. Well, Part, part of the problem is the definition of what is art, okay? And some of the things that pass for art, like a piece of canvas with white paint on it, <laughs> a computer could do that. The examples I've seen have been kind of weird. There was, there was a gal down at UCSD who was inventing new colors, and she came up with these colors, a skanky bean, and the computer came up with the names, and <laughs> it, it, it just <laughs> got awful. And then there's another one that came up with lyrics. I don't, I don't remember the lyrics, but they showed it, the computer a picture, and the picture was able to identify a Christmas tree in there. It came up with some lyrics to fit sort of a Christmas song, but it was absolutely, pr now maybe somebody would think it's modern music or something like that, but it's Christmas, I'm happy, it's Christmas. <laughs> it's just, uh, I'm skeptical, okay, unless you have a very broad definition of what art and music in, is. So. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Celeste. Um, I'm a senior at CMC. And I have a question about <laughs> Hello? OK, cool. Hi. Um, and so it's less so about the regressions that are run in the um, kind of predictive analysis, but more so like AI chatbots and virtual assistants, because the reality is that more people every day are turning to voice search and talking to their Alexas and their Google Homes. And where do you think that ends? Because the, the software that exists now from Google is not as big of a failure as Google Flu was, but it is it works, but it's still pretty rough, and yeah. it's definitely it's going to progress. And where do you think that is going to either fizzle out or... I think in terms of what AI can do, that's probably in the near horizon. Being able to master word, turn, turning sound, sound waves into words and then associate what those words mean. Okay? And one of the scary things is uh, there was that incident where... Uh, some television commercial for Burger King or something? And the commercial says something about, go buy a hamburger. And the little uh, Google Assistant or the, the Amazon Assistant perked up and wanted to go buy some hamburgers or something. <laughs> so that, that was kind of weird. But I think, I think that's relatively easy. And to take sound waves and translate them into words. And if it's been pre-programmed to say, turn on the TV means this, means push that button, that's pretty easy. Uh, Hi. I'm uh, Ben Bracker from Harvey Mudd College. Uh, I've been reading some books actually on uh, uses of algorithms. Essentially, my question is um, you show how algorithms can spit out absolute gibberish. And I think large companies, you know, would be smart enough to realize this, you know, especially with the example you're giving where it's up and up and then it crashes. I think companies have been using algorithms long enough to know that that can happen when they use uh, random inputs. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about like why they're uh, kind of why companies still persist in using these algorithms. Do you think it's because perhaps when they do uh, inputs that are relevant, they do find genuine correlations? Do you think that it could also be um, perhaps because there's a self uh, feedback loop, a self creating feedback loop? Such as one example I read um, was where with the uh, algorithms that tend to predict criminal intent, uh, when y people rely on these algorithms, they uh, sort of like self-validate, uh, and so it seems like the algorithm's correct. Do you think it could also be, uh, in addition, the fact that companies want to hide their decisions behind you know, complex systems so as to almost scare away mm -hmm. investigators? What do, what do you think are some of the explanations as to why they're being Is used? Is Jay here? Jay Cornish? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak for him. 
he was in the industry for 15 years, and I think the right answer is that managers don't understand AI, and they think because it's a computer, you should trust it, you should believe it. And in fact, they don't self-correct. They go on making mistakes time after time after time, and they always attribute to, well, something changed. There was a change in the environment, a change in the parameter. Let's just keep going, and it'll work because computers are smarter than us. Uh, Jay, do you want to chime in on this? Oh, get a, mi get a microphone. I would just add that a lot of times what they actually do is design and conduct experiments. So they're not really doing this data mining stuff as much as maybe you think they would, because that kind of makes the headlines. A lot of people are actual data scientists. They come up with an idea. They run a randomized A-B experiment. You that know, would be Jay. They, that would be Jay. Yeah. <laughs> so they might not know exactly why like page A works better than page B, but it causes the revenue to go up. And they did it with a randomized experiment. They didn't do this like data munging stuff. But then there are the other people who are called data clowns. Yeah, <laughs> there are clowns. So, and, yeah. And what the clowns do is, if it works, use it. Up is up. Yeah, that was a big problem I ran into at work. There would be a lot of times where someone would do something and they would see the result. And one of the, the craziest things that you haven't mentioned yet is regression to the mean. It's everywhere. And so, for example, it was at an internet company where underperforming domains that we had to optimize, we, they were handed over to a friend of mine and they said, what can you do to these? We should, we should tinker with the layout, we should put the keywords, do something. Okay, so he works on it, the next day revenue's up like 20%. Fantastic, he's a hero. Every time they give him these domains, every week revenue goes up 20%. Well, it turns out that one week he forgot to do it, revenue went up 20%. <laughs> <laughs> and so they come to him and they're like, well, this is great. We want to do this with other people. He's like, oh, actually, I never got around to it. And they're like, well, whatever you did worked. <laughs> you know? And it's like it doesn't even occur to them. And this is this regression of the mean concept, which Gary actually came in and helped. He actually came to our company and helped kind of teach us about this concept, which is everywhere. Even when you run real experiments, you see kind of the ones that win the experiment don't tend to do as well. And it's everywhere. You got another book on this that you got to read. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, what is it? It's what the, the luck. What the Luck. What the Luck. You guys got to read that. It's huge. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's working. Nice. Um, I'm Elliot. I'm a senior. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is actually a bit of a flip on uh, your statement about the problem. Right. And it's off of Celeste's uh, question. So I worked for a chatbot company my sophomore summer. Um, and I'm, like, not a programmer or, like, a natural language processing person or like anything like that. And the like necessary complexity of a chatbot was something that I found that I could make after three months. Not because like it was capable of human conversation, but because it was capable of conversations that humans would partake in. And that was just super interesting to see. Because like it obviously wasn't AI. Like it was like very simple, like um, essentially sales oriented feedback, like loops um, that would like provide a more customized experience uh, for like the buyer yeah. to essentially like purchase goods that were like more in line with their other um, like aesthetic choices. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my concern isn't that we're gonna think like that we think that computers are smarter than us, but that we're becoming as dumb as computers. <laughs> um, and I'm just curious like besides educating ourselves through things like your book, like what we could, um, what we can do to um, resist that. I guess. Yeah, I'm would not be sure the right about that. I got an interesting sidebar, though. There's the Turing test, yeah. which is uh, I'm here talking to two things. One of them is a computer, and one of them is a person, and they're in a room, and I can't see which is which. Or I'm trying to guess which is which. And they figured out to win the Turing test as a computer, what you have to do is act more human like, which is make mistakes. And Turing himself said at the start if you start asking math questions, and this one ma never makes a mistake, I know it's a computer. So in order to win the Turing test, you have to put in grammatically incorrect uh, sentences. You've got to answer questions incorrectly. You've got to get mad and angry. You've got to insult the other person. You've got to act more like a human in order to pass the test. And th these Turing tests, they're, they're, they're interesting, amusing, but they've got nothing to do with anything as far as the you know, real world goes. I mean, Siri's kind of cute that way. By the way, um, you guys get jokes on Siri? 
those are almost invariably scripted. They've actually hired, both Google and, and, and Apple, hired uh, gag writers from Onion and Saturday Night Live and stuff like that to write the little jokes. And so you write in a question that gives a really funny response, and you think Siri's really smart, and it was actually the gag writer who was really smart who put in that funny response. Hi, yeah. back here. Uh, my name is Sasha. I'm a senior here at CMC. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us about uh, AI. And you know, from your presentation, some of the things that AI is not able to answer, like you know, not recognizing a wagon, and instead saying it's a badminton racket. You yeah. know, these are, and or like you know, seeing that something like nothing is actually a cheetah. You know, these yep. are kind of Excuse things me. that we, as we develop and as children, you know, when we're really yep. small. We don't know that that's a wagon at first, but we come to learn it. Right. I'm just sort of wondering, developers of AI who are trying to make AI smarter than humans, what are sort of some roadblocks in their way to making sure that AI, you know, don't doesn't become as smart as humans and right. sort of like you know recognize that it's actually a wagon, not a badminton racket, or you know, sort of teach the AI so that yep. you know, are there any roadblocks if you can. Well, first, computers are getting better and better at this stuff. I mean, the language translation stuff is much, much better than it was five years ago. And the image recognition stuff is much, much better. But my point is, it's not actually seeing things. You know, in, in terms of the image stuff, it's not actually seeing the wagon and the wheels and the handle. It's seeing the little pixels. And so the question is, how do you get the computer to see things the way humans see it? And nobody knows, because we have very little knowledge about how the brain works. How do those neurons, how do they s see something and recognize it? We, we really don't know. And the whole thing behind Hofstetter and, and uh, Shank and people like that is trying to figure out how the brain works so that we can mimic the brain. And we're a long, long way from being able to do that. Now, one of Hofstetter's things, is his latest book, is Analogies, the Fire and Fuel of Thinking, is that we somehow draw analogies to things. And so that wagon, we draw analogies to other things that are look like that without mapping pixels. W you know, we see the little box and the wheels, and whatever, and we draw by analogy, that's probably a wagon, and then we add it to our memory bank, that's what wagons kind of look like, all sorts of variations and stuff like that. But Hofstetter says it's a long, long way before, l many, many years before computers will ever think like humans, but that is the big challenge, yeah. Uh, my name's Andrew, uh, CMC Senior as well, and so, so, so sort of on that vein, yeah. um, what do you think it would sort of take for us to go from like the tree to the moon? Like, is it is it a <laughs> back to the ground start, or like could we do it? Or and like if so, what would that entail? Yeah, I don't know. That's what Hofstetter argues and Shank argues. You got to go back to the ground and start over again with the projects that they have been working on for forty years and haven't made much progress on. <laughs> you like that answer? <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. What's your take on climate change? And <laughs> <laughs> how it has to do with AI? Like, ha, like ha, is there any... Why, like why do we need AI for that? Well, because because it clearly it's like thinking on a planetary level requires massive, like, you know, changes of data if you're going to have a renewable uh, electric grid, right? Uh, like, you mean how can AI be used in that and where... Yeah, I don't know. No? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> seems to be more to do with human behavior than with AI. Hi, um, thank Hi. you for your talk. I'm Caroline. I'm a senior at CMC. Um, I was kind of wondering, so we, you're kind of like saying that we mistrust these a AIs like completely, or, and I was wondering well, if too often like, we, too often we do, not every Too often, do. okay, I mean, too Shank, often. Shank gets really mad when they say Watson can think. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I was kind of wondering what your take on was like, on the team effort between humans and AI systems. Like sometimes we're not able to analyze big data sets like AI can. And so like I'm kind of wondering like, do you think that we should just dismiss them and like they're completely or like mostly just very often erroneous or like do you think it should be a team effort between humans and AI? I think the, the end of the book is this is why we need human judgment more than ever. And so there's definitely got to be a human part of it, but there's also got to be a computer part in terms of analyzing these big data. I, I just can't crunch the numbers. The stuff I do, I couldn't crunch without a computer. On the other hand, it's got to be a scientific method type thing, like running experiments to compare stuff, like that thing that I did with the heart attacks, searching through 100 random things and looking for correlations. It's worthless. 
because you know you're going to find something. I found it in random data, so it proves nothing at all. If I can find it in random data, then I can find it anywhere. Okay, and so I can use common sense. You know, does this actually make sense? And if it makes sense, then do a control experiment. Like for example, aspirin. Aspirin prevents clotting of blood. People, scientists knew that. Blood clots lead to heart attacks and strokes. Scientists knew that. So maybe aspirin, taking aspirin, would prevent heart attacks and strokes. So they set up a controlled experiment where they had 11,000 doctors take aspirin every other day. 11,000 doctors take a placebo every other day. At the end of five years, they decided aspirin did, in fact, significantly reduce the incidence of strokes and heart attacks. And there you got the human brain is telling you what experiment to run. Okay, and then you got the conclusion, which is very different from ransacking data and coming up with buying a lot of footwear is good or bad for you. Time to study. <laughs> Hi. <coughs> Hi. Um, my name's Andrea. I'm a junior. Um, my question is, if we were to like hypothetically be able to read program computers to think like us and then potentially be as smart as us, then do you think there would be a danger or do you think that that danger is made up by humans because of the whole, what you were saying in the first few slides about us yeah, giving I, them human. I don't know. I do know it's a long way off. But okay. You and I will both be gone before that ever happens. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Hofstadter, who I really, really respect a lot, says it's not theoretically impossible for humans, for computers, to have emotions, to tell jokes, to have feelings, to think, to understand the world, but it's many, many years in the future. And so I don't know what's going to happen, you know, many, many years in the future. Time to do homework. <laughs> Should we come? Yeah. Anyone have any more questions? All right, perfect. So it seems that these are all the questions that we have for tonight. Please join me once again in thanking Professor Gary Smith. Thank you.